you know, uh, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to confess something. I, I gave this message about a month ago. And the reason I'm, the Lord asked me to go to this message was because of you're the home church. Uh, I gave this message to my church at Dallas Bible Church. Uh, I actually, for the last year and a half, the Lord told me to, I haven't been going out. I haven't been engaging the community. I haven't been engaging the culture. Sounds kind of weird from a ministry that that's what you do. I have been teaching through Genesis, through Revelation, literally 730 lessons uh, because the Lord wanted me to go deeper with him. And in that, the Lord started to show me certain things, and I needed to release a word over Dallas Bible Church, which is Laura and I, my wife and I, our home church, and there's a base in Dallas, and I felt like because of the open house that we had here yesterday, the national office opening up in Sarasota with Tom Revi, I felt like I needed to say the same message here because this is exactly what Ryan and Kim and the team are doing here. And so that's why I want you to hear my heart behind this. And I don't normally talk about my birthdays or how old I am. It's not like I care. But uh, I turned 40 this last summer. Uh, and my wife decided to do this. Uh, hey, let's have all your friends and family uh, just send in, you know, the classic one words and encourage you and uplift you. And <laughs> we did this with our team. And I had a lady... Uh, she sent me a word, and the word was, she said, the word that the Lord gave me for you was the word coal. Who wants to get the word coal for your birthday? Anybody? C-O-A-L. And we have a, there's a quote up here on the, on, on the screen here. Th this is what it was. Her name is Susan. New, this is what Susan wrote to my wife and I. And she said, as I argued with the, the Lord about the word coal, thinking as a worldly thinks nobody wants coal in their stockings, he gently reminded me, your thoughts are higher than your thoughts from Isaiah 55, 8, and I am the giver of good gifts, found in James 1, 17. So she sent it to me and just said, I trust that, you're, you're, that the Lord's going to show you what to do with this word coal. Man, I love the words when they were talking about, you know, you're an encourager or whatever positive things, right? But every time my wife and I, we went out to Minnesota. My wife's from Minnesota. I'm from Indiana. We live in Dallas, four kids, and we're in uh, Park Rapids, Minnesota. It's the middle of nowhere, but it's an unbelievable saying like you guys don't have anything pretty around here. You guys, you win actually. But when I talk to Dallas, it's just concrete. So, uh, and so I'm here, I'm walking around the lake in Minnesota and I'm processing this word coal. And I'm like, I don't know if you've ever gotten to the point where you're just, you ever get to the point where you talk out loud to the Lord? Does anybody ever do that? You guys remind me of Indiana people. <laughs> just kind of nod your head. You could, it's okay, we can talk. Wade, you and I will talk. Wait, I know you talk to the Lord out loud because you do it all the time. I'm talking to the Lord out loud in these woods. And like, I'm like, Lord, what's the word coal mean? And I'm thinking of, you know, remember the illustration of the coal on the lips, right? You hear, hear about him send me, all this. And I'm going through this process. And as I'm talking to the Lord, I forget that there are people that might see me. And I'm walking down. And I got my hands up. And I'm like, yes, Lord. And he's like, hey, how you doing? And I was like, oh, we're great. And he, he looked at me like, you just said, we're great. Like, so he looked around, like, is there anybody else with you? And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, it's just me and Jesus. <laughs> that guy didn't think it was too funny. He thought it was weird. And too bad my cabin was too away from him the whole week. So every time he saw me, I know he was just thinking, that guy just, he has multiple personalities. He talks to himself. You know, all this stuff. And then finally, I started looking up in Scripture, this word, uh, the word coal. And it's interesting. There's a Greek word. I don't worry. You don't throw out too much Greek. But there's a word, anthrakeia. Anthrakia. This word anthrakia is found in the phrase charcoal fire. Okay, this word, this phrase is only twice in all of the New Testament. It's kind of interesting because the first time, uh, it's actually this word charcoal fire. Let's see if, Ryan, if we can get this thing to. It's in a, uh, what? Well, th there will be no sermon if I can't get this. Anybody? Got a lighter? Tony, you want to bring your matches up? This is really awesome, actually. We, just so you know, we tested this. Now watch, Ryan's going to come up and just light it, no problem. This is going to be great. <laughs> just, no, just keep doing it. You do it. Apparently, that is so awesome, by the way. I'm here for you. Uh-huh. Did you guys hear me clicking it? I mean, it was legit, right? Okay, just keep the fire going to the other side. Well, yeah, light that one while we're at it. 
Some of you have completely checked out by now, so that's okay. All right, so the first, first phrase, <laughs> those things just crack me up. Okay, so the first phrase is anthrakia, okay, is, the, is a charcoal fire around when Peter actually denied Jesus. Three times, Peter was hanging outside of a, of a courtyard. We'll get into this a little bit. He's outside of the high priest's courtyard. He's not in there, but he's in the courtyard, and he's around a fire, a charcoal fire. That's the first phrase, and I was like, well, Lord... That's not a very good word, because you know Peter denied Christ three times, and this is the word this lady gives me? I was like, you can have that word back. So I was like, Lord, I need another word, so thank you, Ryan, for lighting this fire. <laughs> and the other one is, is uh, if anybody's familiar with the end of John, the Gospel of John, there's an illustration when the guys are on a boat, they're fishing, and then Jesus is on the seashore, and do you know what he's doing? He's making fire, and he's cooking it, and he's inviting his disciples. There's two times of fire, two times that that word, coal, charcoal fire, is used. One time of a fire here, and I'll just tell you now, it's a fire of refinement. And then there's another fire, it's the fire of restoration. I'm going to walk through these two fires, because I actually believe one of us in this room is at one of these fires. I actually gave this message to the Avis rental car lady yesterday. I go, you got 30 seconds I can give this message to you? She goes, yeah, sure, fine. Like, whatever. And I gave it to her, and I said, where are you at? And she shared, and she gave me an upgrade, by the way. <laughs> and my prayer is this, because I believe that the Lord is speaking to me about these fires. My prayer is that he'll speak to you about one of these fires. And so, Father, I'm going to ask in the name of Jesus that... You're a fun God, but God, you're a God who loves to speak to our hearts. And Jesus, I'm going to ask that you would do that now. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the commissioning. Thank you for the offering. Thank you, Lord, that you have already set the table. Jesus, would you just do your work right now in your name? Amen. You're going to see a handful of slides, but one of the things, I think it's pretty obvious, but Peter, first and foremost, you guys have a, uh, a little... In your bulletin, you have a little notes. I, I'm going to give you a couple points. One of them is, is, first and foremost, Peter was called to Christ. If you guys want to integrate that, you'll see this. Is Peter is called to Christ first and foremost. I mean, think about this. In Matthew 4, okay, look, look at this. He, Jesus clearly says, follow me. I mean, look at this. He told them, and I'll make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. So clearly, there was a time that Peter was called, Okay. So in, in our context, this calling, in my opinion, when you put your faith in Christ, I believe you've been called. Would you guys agree? Yeah, yes? Wade? Thank you. I mean, think about this. Twelve guys are hanging out with Jesus, and you get to experience the Sermon on the Mount. Can you imagine experiencing Jesus walking on water? I mean, Peter got to experience literally uh, his mother-in-law being healed. Peter got to experience the, the raising of the widow's, the widow's son. You know, when Jesus sent out his disciples, you know he sent them out to, to raise people from the dead. Do you, did you know that? Because it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to embrace it. Look, we come from conservative worlds, we come from charismatic backgrounds, whatever the context is, you have one option, either all of this is true or none of it's true. You, you, can't, you can't pick this thing apart, you guys. You either believe that God still does miracles in raising people from the dead, or you don't. You believe that God can take 5,000 people plus women and children and feed them all because he just had a little bit of loaves and bread you, and fish. Like You either believe that God still does that, or he doesn't. And Peter understood that he was called to walk this thing out. I love this calling. And in fact, Peter was, if you'll go to the next slide, Matthew 16, this is kind of cool. You know, there's so many contexts. And remember when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? There's only one guy in Scripture that clearly identifies who the Christ is. Scripture says, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Christ clearly said, my father has revealed this to you. This isn't from flesh and blood. This is the Spirit of God revealing this to you. So clearly, Peter has a call on his life. Look, where we're going to go today, 
Nothing's going to make sense unless you understand, first and foremost, you have a calling on your life. Now, here's the crazy thing. It doesn't have to be Ryan, Kim, Noah, and Heather that have the calling. This is where we've gone wrong in the United States, very clearly. I believe we're supposed to send out people. I believe it's a thing that the body of Christ is supposed to do. But what we've done in the American church is we said, I'm going to pay somebody to go so I don't have to. This is what's happened in American culture. You guys know statistically, Barna, Gallup, whoever you want to do the surveys, the surveys are saying the American church is not sharing the gospel. Now, when I heard, you know, a couple weeks ago, like you guys are beginning to, your hearts are beginning to stir because you're believing you've been called. You're believing that you can actually impact uh, these streets. That's so important in the American church. The reason that we need missionaries to come here is because we've said no. Would somebody agree? It's true, you guys. There's a reason that we're going through all this stuff. And here's what I want you to understand. You have been called. It's huge. You have a calling. And so Peter got to experience all this. And in fact, here's a little bit of an application side to this. And so here's what Jesus said in John 16. In John 16, he begins to walk this out. He says, look, I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. He wants you and Peter and me to understand. If we adhere to the word of God... We can actually make this thing called life, we can make it through. You got to listen to my teachings. You got to adhere to my lifestyle. So I'm going to say these things so that you don't stumble. Well, what is he concerned about the stumbling? That you'd walk away from your calling. He wants you still to embrace your calling. But here's the deal. Jesus, in the midst of calling people, he still warns them. And in fact, here's a second point if you want to write this down. You need to pay attention to the words of truth. Even though you've been called, what happens is, and I I believe this, Ryan, you even talked about this, we don't want to hear hard words. I was in Santa Fe, (laughs) and I remember a pastor, he said to me, Kyle, if you tell my congregation that that whole Bible is true, you will lose half of the churches. There were 70 churches in the city of Santa Fe at that time. You will lose half the churches if you tell them that all of the Bible is true. And guess what? I lost half of the churches. You want to know why? Because we don't want to adhere to hard words. Now, watch this. Watch some of these hard words. This is really bizarre. John 13. Remember, Jesus says, Peter, you've been called. And in John 13, he says, look, Simon Peter said to him, where are you going? And Jesus said, well, where I'm going, you can't follow me. Now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, well, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, will you lay down your life for me? I assure you, a rooster will not crow until you've denied me three times. Has anybody ever heard a, a prophetic word spoken into your life before? Like, do you know what I mean by that? Somebody that says they have something from the Spirit of God and, like, they just share that with you? It happened to me this year. Somebody wrote me uh, probably a two-page, I don't know, letter that was from the Lord that ripped me to shreds. On anything you can think of about who I am in my walk with the Lord, they called me out on every layer. Nobody really likes to hear those words, do you? Nobody really likes... When somebody says something and it makes you be refined, but you don't, nobody really wants to actually have to work on things in your life. Is that a fair statement? Nobody likes the fact that you're called out. And man, I'm just going to tell you, it crushed me. So in this process, I want to give you a couple things here. When you get a word, uh, if you'll go to the next slide for me. When you get a word, I want you to make sure, please, please, please be careful as you walk out your calling, to, to be careful about making a pledge. Andy said something today, and I'm going to run with this just a little bit. He actually said some of you in this room might be called to, to full-time missions. Did I hear that accurately? So if you're going to walk out your calling, one of the, one of the warning signs for you is, is okay, uh, be careful. It says, look what Scripture says in Ecclesiastes, better not to vow than to vow and not pay. In other words, if you're going to say, I'm all in for the Lord... You better do it. 
But I see too many people. I spoke at a university once in Columbia, South Carolina. It was a, a, a Christian university. Literally hundreds of people came to the front. Hundreds after the sermon. Yes, I am all in. I saw three people after that for about a year. That's it. Three out of hundreds. Why? Because as you're walking out your calling, be careful that you don't just say something because you're supposed to say something. And then the scripture even talks about this. Why? Because our flesh is, our flesh is weak. Walking out our calling, you have to understand, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> you remember the Bible verse when Jesus asked his disciples to pray? How many of them stayed awake? Any, anybody? Like walking out your calling is really, really, really hard. I'm going to go to the next point here. So what does Peter do? Well, Peter, because he hears a word, he becomes self-driven. Okay, what do I mean by that? Anybody automatically know what does that mean, self-driven? You can tell me. Any thoughts? Yeah, he makes it happen on his own. So let me put it in a context of a church. Sometimes a church says we're going to do something, but they don't ever seek the Lord. They just do it. I actually believe that's when we get into trouble. And so what happened to Peter is he became so self-driven, he said, okay, I'm going to do the opposite. In fact, if you go to John 18, look at this text. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, remember this when Jesus was arrested? Remember this? And everybody's coming to the table, and all of a sudden, what does Peter do? He drew a sword, struck the high priest slave, cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So instead of like trusting the Lord in this process, Peter takes it into his own hands and cuts off a, a slave's ear. So in order to walk out his calling, Peter's like, I'm going to make something happen. Look, I actually believe many of us get to this point in our calling. God, if I'm going to help usher in the kingdom, I'm going to do something so drastic. My heart might be in the right place, but this is what I'm going to do. So think about this. All of us have been called to this process. And in this process, I actually believe he gives us warnings or guardrails to stay in this lane. And in this process, though, we want to, I have a tendency, let me tell you this, I have a tendency to want to make something happen. So if God's doing a calling on my life, well, I'm going to see how can I make it happen. It's called the flesh. And I really believe if God is speaking to somebody in this room today to be raised up on full-time missions, and you guys, that can look in all kinds of different ways. It could mean you're taking care of an orphanage overseas. It could mean, well, you're supposed to serve here in the city full-time and leave your job, literally quit your, your full-time job and start actually having to go into the mission field here in Sarasota. Whatever the context is, you can't make it happen yourself. And that's really, really, really frustrating because what happens is if you do, there's a couple verses or a couple applications, you'll fall. Your pledge, your vow says, I'm going to actually do this full time. But whatever the commitment is, scripture says pride will lead to a fall. Proverbs 16, 18 says pride comes before destruction in an arrogant spirit before a fall. And then here's the reality is that in Matthew 26, it says we will stumble sometimes. Jesus said to him, tonight all of you will run away because of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So even those that ran with Jesus eventually will run away. You're like, well, this isn't really that exciting. Here's why I want to go to this message today. Because I need, uh, my prayer is, is for the American church that we would be so sold out that this stuff isn't an issue anymore. Look, when you travel for 12 years to the American church, this becomes the, the theme in the American church. So here's what happens. This is kind of crazy. Uh, it's the first fire. If you'll go to the next slide, Michelle. The fire of refinement. So you go through this calling. We've all been called. And in this calling, then what happens? Well, okay, you understand that God's saying, this is how I want you to stay in these lanes. And then in this process, he then actually says, but be careful of being driven by your flesh. Because if you're driven by your flesh... It was what will happen at the fire of refinement. You guys know this story well. Peter's hanging out at the courtyard, right? And as he's hanging out at the courtyard, I mean, look at this text. Simon Peter was following Jesus as another disciple, and that disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest. So he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter, look at this, remained standing outside by the door, and the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, did you notice? Notice this, this disciple, Peter, didn't even go close. 
He went out and he spoke to the girl who was the doorkeeper. And this girl brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, you aren't one of the man's disciples too, are you? Peter didn't even hesitate, you guys. He says, I'm not. Now the slaves in the temple police, they had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing there warming themselves. And Peter was standing there warming himself. So for the first time, here's what would happen, you guys. In this calling, much of Peter's calling was based on his flesh, not on the spirit of God. Let me make it in American terms. Sometimes our calling is based on going to church on Sundays and Wednesday nights, not because you really believe God's called you. Your flesh can only take you so far. So under pressure, around the fire, Peter said what? No. Not, not just one time. Watch, if you go to the second one, just to prove the point. Simon Peter was standing warm himself. He said to him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it and he said, I'm not. Second time, around a charcoal fire, Peter said no. Third time, it happened again. One of the high priest slaves, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. I mean, this is the guy who knows that Peter was with Christ. He said, hey, didn't I see you with him in the garden? And Peter denied it again and immediately a rooster crowed. Three times around a fire, he rejected Jesus. You know, a couple of the things that people, uh, this one person challenged me with in my letter was, Kyle, you do things in the flesh. Who wants that email? I sought the Lord. I sought counsel. I said, God, what do you mean I, I do it in the flesh? Twelve years, and God, you're saying some of this stuff has been done in my flesh? A couple verses up here just says this is one of the things you got to be careful about in walking out your calling is don't get comfortable with the enemy. Look what, look what Peter was doing. He was sitting with the temple police. And then in the process in Matthew 26, you got to stay near to Jesus. Look, nothing was done immoral of my part. Nothing was done wrong on any of that stuff. It was just somewhere, somewhere in here, somewhere in here, I actually asked the Lord, where and how have I gotten distant from Jesus? You don't reject Jesus three times unless you're walking in the flesh. If you really believe that you've been called to Christ, man, you guys, that flesh has to, it has to go. So what happens? Uh, can you just write this part down? Sifting is painful. You're going to just see how this will all unfold, but. In this process of being called out, if you'll go to the next slide, this is what happened to Peter. You know how Peter responded to this? It says he went outside. I can only imagine what he would do. He, and it says he wept bitterly. Does the sin in your own life make you weep? You can't walk out your calling. You can't walk it out unless it bothers you. So for me, pride. Pride is an issue that somebody called me out on. And you know what? You know what I did, right? I put both hands up and you know what I said? Get lost, right? But finally, I allowed the spirit of God to move in my life and I lost it. I have wept more in these last Let's just say this year than I haven't all my life. And at what point is sin going to bother you in your own life? I actually really believe one of the waves that we have to see in the American church is a spirit of repentance. God help us for us being okay with you fill in the blank. So here, here's what I want to do before I can even remotely move on to that fire. I, I actually want you to understand, does the sin in your own life even remotely bother you? Because I promise you this, if it doesn't, you won't walk out your calling. And so Spirit of God, just right now, can I, can I ask you, Spirit of God, please, would you begin to show us? Like, I love Andy's challenge. I love this congregation's challenge to impact. But, Lord, 
And I heard this in a prayer time this morning. We need to be refreshed first before we can refresh others. God, I want us to be refreshed. And so, Holy Spirit, would you begin to highlight something in this room, in somebody's life, in my life, something that, Lord, I know uh, is not from you. Spirit of God, would you just speak to us right now? In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm, I'm going to come back to this. I'm actually going to ask if anybody has anything. I was in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, and I work with, uh, we have an opportunity to work with some high government officials in some other countries, and uh, they were in Dallas, and crazy enough, we were actually looking at raising funds for a building in Jerusalem to work with 12 countries to actually bring their governments to Jerusalem to show support for Israel. Like God was doing some really unique stuff. And in this meeting, uh, one of the folks that was there was Jewish. And I actually said out loud, because here's the deal, there's certain individuals that you have, you, I was afraid to talk to him about the Lord. Let me just put it that way. I became Peter. And I said out loud, don't worry, I won't share the gospel with you. You can say, well, well, that's not denying Christ. That crushed me, you guys. I said out loud, I won't share the gospel with somebody. Well, what does that become? That becomes more about me, does it not? It becomes more of me about my flesh and what's the next step and how can I move forward. And instantly, I went to the fire. And I haven't stopped weeping over the fact that I said I wouldn't tell one person about Christ. Maybe you're like, Kyle, that's extreme. But like, my point is, is, you guys, do we not deny Christ in our own ways, in our own environments? Like, We have to stop playing this political game about, oh, it might offend somebody at my school. It might offend uh, my employer. It might offend my neighbor. You guys, we have to get past that whole point. The reality is, is that our folks around us need the gospel. It's either, this is how one of my mentors always said, you're either the missionary or the mission. If you're not talking about it, you're the mission. And so for me, I had to really work through the fact that I denied Christ in front of a government official because I was afraid what would happen to me about not getting back led into that country. Like I have power anyway to do that. And so it was a pride thing. All I would just say is, is, look, if there's a sin in your life, and I, I'm not here to, to stir up junk. I'm here to set you free because I think that's what Christ asks us to do. And so for me, I had, to, I had to get past this fire in order to experience that fire. But here's what I think most of us do. I think we hang out in this fire. Uh, you don't understand, Kyle, what I've done in the past, or you don't understand, I'm not qualified. We play this game in the American church. If I could only get past the fact you don't have to be ordained to walk out the gospel. You don't have to be a, do you have to have a certificate, Ryan? And I think we live in this place of this fire of refinement. Look, it's a good place to be, but it's really painful. And in fact, there's, look at these, if you, you're going to see this list up here. Here's where I lived for a while. I lived in the place of failure. Anybody ever done something that you're like, man, that really wasn't of God? Did he, thank you. Wade, Wade is, thank you. Here's the deal, you guys. I think we all have lived in this place at some point. Failure, I love what Reverend Coleman Tyler says. He goes, failure isn't final. I don't have to live in this place that I messed up. Just a couple other points. Failure doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means you haven't yet succeeded. The only time you can't afford to fail is the very last time you try. I could actually say, you know, I screwed up. Really, I wasn't called, and I'm going to go away from my calling. I, I promise you, I have been tempted more times in my life to quit my calling this year than any time in my life. Look at this one. Uh, failure doesn't mean you've accomplished nothing. It just means you've learned something. Doesn't that sound like a good parent parable? Failure doesn't mean you've become a fool. It just means you've made a costly mistake, and you can learn a great lesson through it. 
Failure doesn't mean you don't have what it takes. It just means you need to persevere and do things differently next time. Amen? I like this one. Failure doesn't mean you're inferior. It just means you're not perfect. And I'll be honest, uh, my wife, Laura, I asked for more prayer than I ever have in my life. I, I'm, I'm afraid I have completely failed. Sifting is extremely painful. But here's what I love about the Lord. There's a, another point up here. And look what, look what Jesus said to Simon, you guys. This is really cool. He says in Luke 22, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You know what that means? Jesus already knew Peter was going to do this, but here's what his prayer was. His prayer is that his faith wouldn't fail, so that the whole point of turning back to him was what? So that he can strengthen somebody else. So my failure could actually be an answer to somebody else's prayer. That by me walking through certain things could actually imply, guys, maybe the Lord wants to strengthen you in this process. Some of you have had uh, an affair in this room. Statistically, it would actually say somebody in this room has probably had an affair. Statistics will show somebody in this room has probably cheated on your taxes. If you're honest, you're like, well, I didn't file that, but it's okay. That's called cheating your taxes. Some of you have compromised your, your lifestyle. Some of you have actually said it's okay for homosexuality to be okay. Folks, that's a compromise of what the scripture says. Some of you have actually said, you know, hey, I'm considering right now. I'm not talking about your past, but I'm talking about right now. Hey, I'm considering an, an abortion. You say, well, God, you're covering every single, I am. Because I think here's what happens is that all of these things, somebody, somewhere, we live in that identity. That I've done that and that's my identity. You know how many times I interact with people on the streets? What do they say? Uh, this is what I've done. This is who I've become. It's like God can't set people free. In the church, even though we put our trust in Christ, we stay in this fire rather than move into that fire. I'm telling you, if the church could fully understand, he has come to not let you live in this identity, but give you a whole new one. That's when you'll see Revival. And you can't do it on your own. You know, what's happened is, is that we've actually had American churches and believers actually camp out in these identities. And you know what they say? This is who I am. Guys, that's the complete opposite of what Christ has asked us to do. Hey, I've screwed up and I'm okay that I've screwed up. God help us. God have mercy on the American church. And here's what it says in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Like you either believe he can set you free, even as a believer, or you don't. And I, here's what I'm telling you. Most people don't take the time to actually ask the Lord, is there anything in my life that I need to be set free from? Because people ask me, how do you run so hard and so much after people? I want to tell you, because I'm free. I have nothing to hide if I came and I talked to the Avis lady at the counter. Why? Because I'm totally set free. But most of us are afraid that we might actually be exposed. Just one little area, and I want to encourage you guys, if you confess this, you're free. The key, in all honesty, of going out and sharing the gospel is letting everything go. You don't have to be perfect, by the way. You just need him to help you be cleansed. And then look at this. In Galatians 5, you guys know this text. Christ has liberated us to be free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. So here's the deal. I can't go back to this fire. You know that, right? That's, that's the ultimate goal. That I don't come back to this posture of hanging out with the enemy and drawing away from the Lord. No, no, no. Obviously, he says, I want you to go the other direction. There's a video we actually put together uh, just, just for actually this message. And it's about people that we've interacted with on the streets that talk about this very thing. So if you guys can, if you can cue up that video, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. 
I'll tell you what, life is messed up for me right now. Bad. I've been a Christian for 20 years. Glory to God. And uh, I've had a messed up life. And I just, uh, no matter what it is, I'm like one step away from total insanity. But I love the Lord with all my heart and he sustains me. I stay within his presence all the time. I worship. Um, I've seen too much. I know that God is real. I don't struggle with my faith. I, I just struggle with his, his timing. You own a Bible? I do. I feel like it's something that's holding me. You know, I was just praying, walking through the house, saying, um, Lord, how am I get out of here? I was just asking that. You've heard this truth. Mm -hmm. You believe this. I know you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what? you got to embrace it. Okay. The Bible says if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Your future's in the Lord. The past is the past. I'm scared about that because I believe in God. And the Bible says that those who know the truth, they will be the first that will have to, to support the consequences, you know? And I'm trying to go back because my life has changed since I left the, the faith, you know? Do you believe that Jesus died, buried, and came back to life? Do you believe that he's your Lord and Savior? Yeah. Okay, good. Do you read the Bible often, ever? Yeah. Um, like just about every morning. Yeah. A little, uh, you know, Bible app on my thing. Uh, you, you have to, you have to continue, continue. Be about, be about. Just don't, don't play the, the part. Of just you can't just say that. Oh yeah, I'm Christian. You gotta walk, walk that way. That's right. And when you do, <laughs> gosh, man. Ever assuming thing. I mean, you talk to the Lord, you pray to the Lord. I mean, at what point did you ever say, Jesus, I need you to be in charge of my life? I say it a lot, but then I always backslide. Do you believe that Jesus has truly set your sins free? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I just keep on feeling it. It's just like, just do it. Just do it. What's just. Just do what? Just trust him. Just trust him. Yeah. Just everything that you know that's inside my heart that I can't say. I know you know it. Just please, just forgive me for it. because I prayed for you to come here. <laughs> you, have no, you have no idea. You know, I love this, these images. There's a people from Wisconsin, Mississippi, Florida, and the guy with the hood is from London. And it really is this Psalm 51, God created me a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Like this is really the heart behind this because in order to experience this fire, a spirit of repentance has to take place. And I think what's happened is in my own life, I've become so driven that I've forgotten to ask the Lord to cleanse me of my sins that's preventing me from running. And a pastor friend in Alabama, he preached on repentance for one Sunday, and he felt like the church didn't get it. So then he preached the next week, and he said, Kyle, they're not getting it. So then he preached the next week. It became over 40 weeks straight of a, of a repentance message. You want to know the crazy thing? It was the same message every week. I think sometimes we become so stuck. Sometimes we need emails to say, guys, I think there's an area in your life that maybe could be refined. So this first fire is a fire of refinement. Can you imagine, I've been processing this, what it would be like to be Peter 
to have to have denied Christ and then have to wait to interact with him for the first time? Can you imagine that, that feeling? Does that make sense? Like he had denied Christ and then he hasn't, doesn't see him. I, I just want to encourage you guys. Like he wants you to be broken from that weight and from that guilt in order to get to this fire. And here's what happens. He begins to use things. It's crazy. It's called literally this fire of restoration. I want to walk you through this. This is really kind of cool. I, I actually believe Peter wanted to change. And in fact, in John 21, verse 8, look what this scripture says. But since they were not far from land, about 100 yards, the other disciples, they came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. And when they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. So what do you think the first thing, when Peter thinks of fire, what does he think of? What? Yeah, it's where he denied him. So when Peter comes up to the, to the edge of the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret, right around you know, the Sea of Galilee area, when he gets up and he sees a charcoal fire, what's his first thought probably? Oh no. These are called triggers. I'm going to give you a couple, uh, some, if you look up here, University of Alberta says this, a trigger is something that sets off a memory, tape, or flashback, transporting the person back to the event of his or her original trauma. Triggers are very personal. Different things trigger different people. A person may begin to avoid situations and stimuli that he or she thinks triggered this flashback. A person will react to this flashback, trigger with an emotional intensity similar to that at the actual time of the trauma. A person's triggers are activated through one of the more of the five senses. And look at this. Sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. Does anybody not love a good charcoal fire? The smell of it is awesome. I, I love it. Can you imagine, though, if that's the smell that you instantly think of when you denied Christ three times? Does anybody have a trigger? Anybody have anything that as soon as you walk into a place, in fact, I was driving through, is it Newtown? Is that right? I drove through Newtown, and in 2016, this is where we had like five guys. Remember this, Ryan? Five guys jumped me and two other guys, like physically jumped us, pushed our camera guy back, and then we got chased by five cars literally out of the community. That's called a trigger. When I saw the tree on the corner of Newtown. So right away, that's where my mind goes. Some of you have way more drastic triggers than that. Some of you have been hurt in the past. You've been abused. Things have been spoken into your life that are not good. You've had family that have hurt you. Whatever the scenario is, you have these triggers. Every time I drive by <laughs> here, every time I drive by a children's hospital, every time, every time, I think of my daughter when she was 18 months old, she had a rare blood disease. She was treated like she had cancer, LCH. Eight kids out of a million get it. And every time that's what comes through my head. But then here's the cool part. I could stay in that place or I could think about, wow, praise God, my daughter's 14, experienced homecoming, and is living for the Lord. But like you cannot stay in these triggers in the past. You want to know why? Because you can't walk out your calling. These triggers radically get in the way. And here's what's so crazy about Christ. He wants you to address the triggers head on and heal you from those things. Does that make sense? You know, we dance around these issues, though, don't we? Like, does there any families? I, I, I already, I'll say mine. A lot of families don't like to talk about issues, so we just skirt them under the rug. So we just don't talk about things that bother us. Is that true? You're like, I'm not even going to say anything out loud. But that's true. We don't address these things. And so because of that, we cannot experience our true calling in life. These triggers set us off. And so to me, it's this touch, this taste. Now, if you go to the next slide, look at this. So here's what's interesting. Dr. Terry Ellis, he says this. Peter saw the fire, and more importantly, I'm sure he smelled it. Charcoal has a distinct smell, doesn't it? Not like wood at all. Peter smelled the charcoal fire. One or more powerful memory triggers is the sense of smell. In a certain aroma will fire synapses and take you back to an event associated with that smell. So here's what I did with my family in order to prepare for this message. I said, kids, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to actually make charcoal. Just so you know, I'm not wired to be a guy that makes charcoal. Anybody ever made their own charcoal? Apparently, 
some of you are either then. <laughs> and so I wanted to make this charcoal because I wanted to go through this process to make charcoal. And then you know what's crazy about this whole thing? Once you make it all, and I'm not going to go through the, all these illustrations, but then you put it in a container, right? And you put it in a container and you close up the lid so that it, it purifies itself. Do you know that? You have to get rid of all of the unclean things in the wood in order for it to work. Well, you know what happened? My wife, who we've been married almost 18 years, my wife grabs the container accidentally and then totally burns herself. So when I'm asking and talking about these triggers, these triggers will actually, sometimes, I'm not implying that you have to forget them. You might actually have scars from these things. But then you can say, yeah, but look how Christ has healed me from this. Like, this is the point in the power of Christ. Can you imagine the leader of the Jerusalem church, the leader of the church, was Peter, and he burned Christ three times and said, no. And yet all of a sudden, Christ says, but this is who I want to use. So God's going to use these triggers in your life. If I was to say, Holy Spirit, right now, show us a trigger, I bet somebody in this room, is anybody bold enough to say what a trigger is for you? Does anybody say, if I see this, it triggers something? If I smell this, if I see this movie, if I drive into this town, if I think of this person, those are called triggers. And Christ wants to set you free in order for you to walk out your calling. The reason I believe we're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority that he's given us is because we're hanging out at the first fire still. Anybody bold enough? Yeah. Can I give you a, can I, can I give him the mic? Is that okay? 2011, I was attacked at work, and I ended up in a mental hospital for three weeks, and I had PTSD, and I couldn't even drive down the same road where I used to work. It was a trigger every single time. Thank you for sharing. It's real. Anybody else have a trigger? It doesn't have to be as dramatic in that sense because it's pretty real. Anybody else? I just, the Lord showed me in my prayer time. I was supposed to hang out here for a little bit. So if you don't, it's okay. Uh, so my senior year of college, I uh, disobeyed the Lord and hung out with a certain girl I shouldn't have. And so every time I see this girl, what does it do? That memory comes back to your mind. And uh, she's still connected to friends of mine. And so I see her occasionally. But I think the amazing thing is, is that I know that I've repented. And I know where I'm at now and walking in freedom with the Lord. And uh, it was actually after that relationship that the Lord set me free. And so now I've got a I guess the second fire perspective. Amen. That's good. Amen. Man, that's awesome. Look, this is what we're talking about. Both of these scenarios, if we stay in that past that the enemy has already won, whether it's abuse, emotional, or things that we've done, you cannot move forward into your calling. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I have a hard time driving into the city where my undergraduate university was at because the experiences were so bad. In fact, I have a hard time driving through the state. It's a small state. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that. Let me just say something about this. Just I want to release something over this. So the enemy can clearly have a grasp on my brother for sharing this. And he might not ever share the gospel in that state because he doesn't want to go there. Like these are the things that the enemy uses to prevent us from walking in complete freedom. Would you agree? Anybody else? Thank you for sharing. Look, I think we all have them, actually. Scripture says in James, when you confess these things out loud to the righteous, you know what happens, right? Healing occurs. So we've got to get to the point where we're past our pride and not willing to actually say something because it might make us look silly. I'm not implying that. I just, I think that's our process that we go through. Anybody else on a trigger? Yeah. Uh, 
um, when I was younger, me and my sister watched a scary movie. We were young, and uh, that night we listened to a worship song. But every time I hear that worship song, I, it takes me back to that when I was young and I was uh, pretty scared. Amen. Practical things. Practical things the enemy uses to take us to a place that's not of him. Can you imagine if Peter never overcame the first fire? Um, God, I'm going to ask that you would begin to speak to hearts right now. Would you reveal those things in this room? God, I'm not doing this for any kind of emotional craziness. I'm not, I just, I'm out of obedience. You told me, Lord, this morning, this is where I was supposed to go. And so I'm going to ask, Father, would you begin to bring forth to light those things that we're afraid to admit that are triggers, but we know they are. So, Father, I pray that we would begin to release those even right now in Jesus' name. Here's what I love about how Jesus does this. This is so fun, you guys. Because I actually really believe Peter didn't know how to overcome the fire. I really believe that. I really believe Peter was like, man, I don't know what to do, God. How do I overcome this scenario? What do I do in this situation? Somebody in this room is processing, yeah, I got it, but really? What do you want me to do with it? Look at this. This is so crazy. <laughs> I love this. If you go to the next verse, if you don't mind. Uh, scripture then says this. Look what Jesus said. Bring some of the fish that you've caught, and Jesus told him. So Simon Peter, he gets up, he hauls the net in, 153 of them. I still love that number. Even though there's so many, the net was not torn. So now watch, here we go to the next verse. Come and have some breakfast, Jesus told him. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, he took bread. Can you imagine Jesus making you breakfast? He did the same with the fish and said, now this was the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised. So now here he is hanging out at the fire. Now if you go to the next text, this is how I know what Christ wants to do in your life. Three times. First time he looks at Peter. He doesn't talk to the other guys. I think this is, he might have, but we don't have it recorded. He said, all right, do you love me, Simon Peter? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. He goes a second time. And he says a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, of course, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. And then the third thing, look what he does. He says, all right, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. He says, you know, he asked that he loved me. Lord, you know everything. You know I love your sheep. And then he said, feed my sheep. Here's what I love about this text. And you can, it's, this has nothing to do with legalism, but I believe it has everything to do with walking out the healing. Three times he gets literally Peter to say, I love you. Three times. Yes, I love you, Jesus. I actually think there's something to articulating out loud, I love you. I want to do something so practical. If some of you have had a trigger in your life, could you just say I love you out loud? Jesus, I love you. I wonder if the second time Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? So the second time, if this is you, would you just say something? Jesus, I love you. Say it out loud. And what happens is I actually think as he continues to confess this around the charcoal fire the third time, I think he was more animated than he ever was the first and the second time. Of course, Jesus, you know I love you. So can you just say it with maybe a little bit more like I'm in. Jesus, I love you. But here's something that I think many people maybe don't talk about. After every illustration of him saying, I love you, go back to the point one. Can you for me, Michelle? Can you go back to point one? Look at this. Look what he says in point one. He says, yeah, I, you know that I love you. And then look what he says, feed my lambs. So he says, say it, but then what does he do? He tells him to do something about it. Second point, look what he does. Jesus, all right, look, man, I know I love you. And then look what he does. He tells them to do something. Third time, look what he does. Third time, he says, yes, you know I love you. And then look what he tells them. He says, now I need you to do something. Look, I believe in order to experience true healing, you can walk through this, but you have to embrace, you got to embrace the fire, folks. You got to be willing to come back. This is, sounds crazy. You got to be willing to come back and address those people, those situations, those states. You got to come back and say, Jesus, I love you, and I'm willing to do something about it in this environment. It means you have to act it out. 
Church, you can talk about going out and sharing the gospel, but until you actually go out and express his love, I think you go back to that fire. And so my prayer is, and my challenge is this, when you see the trigger, when you see the invitation from Christ, will you truly embrace the fire? In fact, just as how I want to close today, and thank you for your patience. If you'll go to the, if you'll keep going for me, if you don't mind, Michelle. Keep going. This is what I want you to do. I want you to be honest with what Christ is asking. If Christ says, I want you to come to the fire, is this, this is the question. Will I lay down my life for Jesus' sake? Peter had to ask that question. Will I lay down my life for others? The other question at the fire is, am I willing to drink the cup the Father gives me? You know what it means? Am I willing to actually suffer for Jesus? Am I willing to, to lose my job? I love you, but he says, then go do something about this. That's not a spirit of legalism, you guys. It's a spirit of desire. I love you so much, I'm willing to do anything. Am I willing to stand alone and make a difference when nobody else cares? Because this is the point, when you can come to this point right here, your triggers are gone. You're no longer in bondage. You're no longer back at this fire. No, no, no. You're all the way at the, at the fire of, and this is what I love, of restoration. Jesus wants to restore every single one of us. But he doesn't just restore us, okay, just so we can be here. He restores us so we can impact the kingdom of God. And I love, man, I, I, can't, I couldn't have asked for a more of a, a commission from you to say, hey, look, some of you in this room are being called to full-time mission. I, I can honestly say in 12 years, we talk about it sometimes from the stage. We ask people sometimes from the stage but it is, not a nor it is not a normal to say, all right, I need somebody to stand up and embrace the fire and say, I'm in. In fact, there's a verse here. This is how I want you to see this verse as I close in prayer. Hebrews 12, 29 says, therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, by the way, you can't be shaken. Even if you messed up, you can't be shaken. Let us hold on to grace. By it, we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and awe. And then look at this. For God, our God is a consuming fire. If you're willing to embrace the fire, I actually think you can walk out the calling. And so, Luke, if you're here team-wise, if you want to come on up, worship. Did I say that wrong? <laughs> Thanks. Um, I want to do this as these guys are going to roll in the spirit here. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where you're at with the fire. I don't know if it's the first fire or the second fire in between the fires. The lady at Avis, she goes, I don't know which fire I am. I think I'm over here. I think I'm over here, but I want to be there. And I promise you there are people in this room that God is calling you to full-time missions. 65, you can do full-time missions. 50 years old, you can do full-time missions. If you're 30 in this room, you can do full-time missions. If you're younger and you're just graduating high school, you can do full-time missions. I don't know what that looks like in your life, but nobody can ever get to any of those points in any environment unless you're willing to let God bring about healing. So here's, here's what I want to do, and I, I just want to do this because this is what the Lord asked me to do in Dallas, so I want to do obedient, be obedient here, is if you need to let go of some of those things, I, I really want you to come forward. You don't have to talk to me. You don't have to talk. I want you to talk to the Lord. And then, Andy, I'll have you just take over and minister what the Lord's prompting you to. But please don't miss this. Please don't miss what the Spirit of God might want to do in your life and call you forth into something, something so ridiculous. Don't miss this. Somebody might look at you funny and that's what you're thinking, but don't, don't miss this. The Holy Spirit, would you just encourage this body to go through this refinement in order to be restored and as a result Lord I really believe you get the glory we experience healing I thank you for Peter and the example that he set that we could learn from and we commit this word to you in Jesus name